Good morning and welcome to the meeting of the subcommittee on zoning and franchises. I'm council member Francisco Moya, the chairperson of this subcommittee. And today we are joined by council members Gridencheck, Levin, Richards, Reynoso, uh, and Lansman. Uh, if you are here to testify, please fill out a speaker slip with the sergeant at arms indicating your full name, the application name or the LU number and whether you are in favor or against the proposal. Regarding the 25 Central Park West proposal on uh, today's agenda, I note that the council is in receipt of a letter uh, of a written statement from the applicant that the application has been withdrawn. Pursuant to council rule uh, 11.60B, the pre-considered LU number uh, C19039ZMM for the 25 Central Park West proposal is hereby withdrawn. Uh, I now call a vote to file the pre-considered LU items number C190390ZMM for the 25 Central Park West rezoning proposal to remove it from our calendar. Uh, council, please call the roll. Chair Moya. Aye. Council Member Levin. Aye. Council Member Richards. Aye. Council Member Lansman. Aye. Council Member Gurdenchik. Aye. A vote of five in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions. Uh, the vote will remain open. We will now move on to a hearing on pre-considered land use items C180524 ZMK and N180525 ZRQ for the 101 Fleet Place rezoning proposal related to the property from Majority Leader Cumbo's district uh, in Brooklyn, and she has joined us. Um, the, the applicant seeks, to, seeks approval of the zoning map amendment to rezone an existing R6 district to a C64 district and to extend the special downtown Brooklyn district as well as a related zoning text amendment to establish a mandatory inclusion area housing area utilizing options one and two. Together these actions would facilitate the construction of a new 14 story commercial building. Um, I now open the public hearing on this application and I'll turn it over to our majority leader for uh, remarks. Councilmember Levin, in lieu of time, I'm going to um, opt not to do an opening statement so that we can get right to the questions and to get to the matter at hand. Thank you, Majority Leader. And I will um, ask Council of the Committee to um, call the roll on the prior vote. A continuing vote of the land use items, Councilmember Reynoso. I vote aye. A vote of six in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions. The items are recommended for referral to the full land use committee. I'll now call the first panel, uh, Raymond Levin, no relation, Fleet Center, INC. You are a panel unto yourself. And then I got to figure out how this works too. Okay.
Please raise your right hand, uh, state your name for the record. Please state your name for the record. Raymond Levin. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and you will answer all questions truthfully? Yes, sir. Um, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Raymond Levin, special senior counsel at the law firm of Herrick Feinstein. Uh, we represent the Lesser Group, which is doing business as Fleet Center, Inc., uh, the applicant for a zoning map amendment to allow development of a 14-story office building on Fleet Place in downtown Brooklyn. Our appearance here today was preceded by multiple meetings with local stakeholders, including our neighbors at University Towers and Ingersoll Houses, the Service Workers Union, the Downtown Brooklyn Partnership, Community Board 2's Land Use Committee, among others. We believe this outreach was part of the reason that there was no uh, objection at any of the three Euler public hearings, uh, the Community Board, Borough President, and City Planning Commission, although there was someone from Rockaway, Queens, who testified against us at the City Planning Commission. Uh, nevertheless, the Planning Commission adopted a zoning map amendment that differed from our proposal. Um, our proposed building of 14 stories, reducing it to nine stories. Uh, where are we? Um, and from approximately 200,000 square feet to approximately 130,000 square feet. We are taking uh, the opportunity of this hearing to outline the effects of this cutback. Uh, the black line on the rendering uh, that's up on the screen um, shows the impact of city planning's action. The uh, part of the building above the black line is no longer viable under the C61 zoning. Our site is surrounded by a large buildings. On this slide, you can see outlined in blue the location of, of the site of our proposed building and the surrounding uh, development. Um, our proposed building had, uh, our proposed 14-story four, building, which had fewer stories than those buildings surrounding it, was further shortened to nine, as you can see on this uh, slide. Uh, the height of our building versus the buildings surrounding us and their relative uh, number of, of floors. Um, rezoning also reduced um, the floor space uh, that we could build for, uh, by some 70,000 square feet. This slide shows the floors that can no longer be, uh, be constructed. So why, do, why does this matter? Um, the Lesser Group owns approximately 40 buildings in New York City, and 20 of those are in Brooklyn. Nearly all house commercial and community facility uses. You can see that from this list, a selected list of some of their uh, tenants uh, in their other buildings in Brooklyn. The kind of uses uh, that are in their buildings enhance communities. Less space means less opportunity for union jobs, less support for not-for-profit tenants, less opportunity for uses desired by the local community, fewer construction jobs and opportunities for MWBE, and less potential for preferential rents. We respectfully request that the City Council Zoning and Franchise Subcommittee of the Land Use Committee recommend reinstatement of the originally requested C64 zoning map amendment, which we contend benefits the community, does not overwhelm Fleet Place, and provide space for 280 additional jobs. Thank you very much. Um, I also have a statement from, um, from the head of the Downtown Brooklyn Partnership. Unfortunately, she could not remain here and wait, wait for the beginning of this hearing. Um, I can either read it or submit it as you desire. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Levin. Um, so I'll ask a couple of questions and I'll turn it over to Majority Leader Kubo. Um, the original application uh, proposes a C64 zoning, which you're now asking the council to restore. Um, the city planning's reason for the modification to C61 is that the C64 district would, quote, overwhelm the narrow fleet place by limiting late light and air and, quote, result in an inappropriate concentration of activity on a narrow street. Um, how, how do you respond to that concern from City Planning Commission? 
Well, I mean, we disagree, obviously. Um, most of the streets in, uh, I shouldn't say most, many of the streets in downtown Brooklyn are uh, 50 feet uh, in width. This one's um, mapped at 60 uh, and will become 60 when the remaining development across the street is built. Um, the building across, across Lee Place um, are in the 30-story range. <clears throat> um, our building uh, is surrounded by open space uh, that is part of the University Towers complex, uh, which, given that that complex has sold its development rights, um, is not going to be redeveloped, and therefore that light and air uh, which is between our building and the first building in University Towers isn't going anyplace. Um, the other, uh, I can also mention that uh, One Willoughby Place, I think is the name of the building, on Albee Square um, is 36 stories on a 50-story street, and there are a number of others that, that we can talk about. Um, so we, we believe that this building, um, which is going to uh, have um, small office space, which is needed in downtown Brooklyn. Um, if Regina had been here, she would uh, talk about that extensively, um, that it fulfills, uh, fulfills a need and would not overburden uh, Fleet Place. At one point in the history uh, of this area, in 2004, there was a zoning change which uh, had a 475 spot parking garage with its entrance and exit on Fleet Place, um, and that uh, change uh, passed muster uh, from an environmental review point of view. So for a number of reasons, um, we do disagree with city planning, um, and, and those are the reasons why. Um, the C61 zoning would permit a 6 FAR commercial development instead of a 10 FAR commercial development. Would you still intend to build an office building under C61? Yes. Um, and your original development proposal also included a school. Um, can you explain why the school was dropped out of the proposal? Um, there were, there were a, a number of reasons. Um, uh, at the time, uh, city planning, which seems to continue to believe that this building is too dense, said it was too dense. Uh, so one of the reasons why um, the school, uh, which would occupy six stories, um, was a, a, of concern was city planning's being concerned about density. The second reason city planning was concerned that if we had the school, we couldn't do a loading dock. Uh, they were concerned about school buses uh, parking on that street. Uh, there were a number of issues that were of concern. Uh, and, and that certainly isn't the only reason, the, the, the between school construction authority and our client, um, the school was sort of shoehorned into the space, and at the end of the day, they just couldn't, couldn't come to an agreement. So there were a, a number of, uh, of issues where uh, the school um, couldn't be done. Uh, and by not having the school, we were able to put in the loading dock that was required. We were able to reduce the density of the site we, you know, from 21 stories to 14. So, um, I guess at that point we felt that we had um, addressed some of the concerns. Um, obviously not all. All right, I'll turn it over to the majority leader. Thank you so much, Chair Levin and Mr. Levin. Wanted to dig deeper into the conversation around the daycare. Um, this is a conversation that we've had at length and uh, a back and forth and a lot of work to try to resolve this issue. So while many of these questions have happened in meetings, I'll be asking you some of the same questions because we need the answers on the record publicly. So to the best of your knowledge, the BCS Daycare Center um, 
services the community in the area? Are you aware of other daycares in that immediate areas that specifically service Walt Whitman, Ingersoll, and Farragut? I'm unaware, but I have not investigated as to whether there are or aren't, so. Okay, well we have. <laughs> and sure you have. <laughs> so the reason why I asked that question is because this is a very serious issue in our community because the Walt Whitman, Ingersoll, and Farragut houses uh, primarily use that specific daycare center for their daycare needs. So let's do a little bit of the history. How long has the BCS daycare center occupied the building? Um, I think our client acquired the building in um, in the 90s. Um, I think they've, I, I believe they've been there for at least 20 years, yes. And are you committed to uh, making sure that the day ce daycare center can return to the new building when it is completed? Yes, we've indicated at all of those hearings I mentioned and today uh, that we will accommodate them back into the uh, new building should they desire to come back. If they you know, haven't found a long-term home and desire to come back, they can come back. Let me ask you this question in another way. How much is the daycare center paying currently for square footage in the building at this time? I believe that their, their current rent, uh, as what I was told, is $15 a foot. When the building is completed, what is the offer that you have made for their ability to return to a similar size space? As, as, far, as, I've, as far as I understand, one, they're not looking for a similar size space. The, the current space is over 20,000 feet. Uh, they're looking for about 12,000 feet. Um, and I don't believe that there has been a discussion of what the rent would be at that point. So that question that you don't have the answer to, therein lies, as some would say, the devil in the details. While they might be welcomed back, the square footage in terms of how much they would have to pay for rent costs could preclude them from actually returning and being able to come back um, into the building once it is completed? Well, well I think that uh, my client is committed to seeing them come back if they desire to come back. What that rent would be would be something that would be uh, acceptable to both them and us. And what, what, that is, what that is, I don't know what it is at this point. Well, as you said, you, you think your client, therein lies another devil in the detail. This is something that we really have to know. Is it a commitment or is it not a commitment in terms of their ability to come back? And just the desire to say we want them to come back, we have to make sure that they can come back because they can financially afford to. I think you're going to be joined at this time. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Benny Benyakir, and I'm with the Lesser Group. Uh, just to answer the question what uh, Majority Leader Ms. Laurie Combo was asking about the future rent when the tenant will eventually come back, um, we're ready to commit to our number of about 15% lower than the market value. Uh, Can you do the math for me as what you consider to be the market value? What would be the market value? And then someone do the percentage calculation for me. It's hard to say what, what the market value is going to be when we're done with the building, but plus or minus, let's say the number is now about, for, new, for a brand new building, let's say $50, we're ready to do between, uh, let's say, between 40 and 42 $43 a foot. So then the answer to my original question was, are you committed to having the daycare return back to the building? And at that cost, they would not be able to afford to come back to the building so that they would no longer be able to have a home where they have currently had a home. The answer to that is we will, we, we're gonna work very closely with BCS to be able to bring them back. 
and uh, my discussions we had in the last week being that we're talking about relocating and possibly bringing them back for temporary space or not non-temporary space, I know that in other area, in other addresses that we gave them, they are willing to pay between 40 and $45. That's why I'm, I'm ready to say that we could work with, that as num with those numbers as well. Let me just say this. So I'm a mom and I have a two-year-old who is in daycare. And so prior to getting elected, I never really understood in real terms the importance of location of a daycare center to your work balance personal life. So where that particular daycare is located, everyone from the Walt Whitman and Ingersoll houses can come up the block, drop their child off, and head right to the train station to be able to go to work. And while that might seem like a small nuance, that that has the ability to take place, that someone wakes up, drops their child off, and goes to the train, we really can't underestimate the importance of that ability to educating a child, a parent feeling safe, their ability to go to work on time and get there and to come back in a reasonable amount of time, do their grocery shopping and go home. So the interruption of that is something that um, will have a major impact on that particular community if that service is not provided. While I hear the need for office space in downtown Brooklyn and we want to have more office space and we want to be able to offer all of these different things, an issue like daycare is something that is also needed. And I'm sure individuals that will be coming to work there are also going to need daycare. So this is, this is an issue that is particularly important to me and we have to find a solution to this um, before we head to a vote on this because unfortunately you have a mom that has a two-year-old and is the majority leader in the city council of a project that could potentially wipe out a daycare center and I can't allow that to happen. I agree, okay. You both agree it seems and you want to say how you much you agree at the same time, it's okay. Well, okay. <laughs> I, I think we've said what we can say at this point on, on, uh, on your concern about the daycare center. Um, the daycare center has been, uh, been at that location for a long time, the last four years on, uh, on year to year leases. Um, uh, which uh, the lesser group has uh, has kept them there um, at obviously below market rents, uh, which if they had let any of those leases uh, run out, uh, the daycare center wouldn't be there now. So um, I think that shows uh, commitment on their part um, to uh, keeping the daycare center, um, and they're going to try to do that. They've been working with, uh, with your office and your staff um, to try and find a reasonable uh, relocation for the uh, several years uh, between uh, the time that they would uh, leave in, in July and uh, when this site would be uh, redeveloped with, uh, with this 14-story office building. Just in layman's terms, what I don't understand is how you are planning to build a 14-story office building that's going to be brand new, larger floor plates, higher floors, that you're gonna have all of this space, but yet the cost of the daycare has to be at what it's at. The numbers would prevent you from keeping them somewhere in the ballpark of what they're currently paying. Will the loss of your anticipated revenue based off of what they were paying would preclude you from actually doing this building? Would this particular project lose money if the daycare was kept somewhere at the level where, we're, where they're currently at? I don't understand that. We will have to work with your staff and them on, on a reasonable solution 
which may or may not include them coming back to this building. There may be another solution out there for the longer term. If there's a space that meets their needs, uh, that can be fixed up for them and uh, is within this catchment area. Um, if they're gonna come back in three years or so, uh, we will have to crunch the numbers and come up with something that makes sense to both parties. I have a lot of other questions, but I'm not even going to go into those because that's really, the, that's the breaking point for me mm -hmm. in this particular project. So between now and this coming before a vote, I would encourage you to turn over every rock in the district to figure out how you will sustain the daycare center during the construction period and how to provide a rent that is affordable to a daycare center that's been in the community for a number of years and to find uh, that sweet spot where all of that can uh, come together because if there's no upside as far as I'm concerned in terms of building a 14-story office commercial building with there not being a daycare component to it. So I respect the information that you've brought forward in terms of the Downtown Brooklyn Partnership and the idea of the need for more commercial and office space, but if we also don't recognize the need for daycare services a as a part of that, then this is a flawed plan to me. So I look forward to uh, receiving more information uh, in regards to that. And this issue is so important to me that I'm asking you to turn over every rock, but I too am turning over every rock to try and discover a solution to this. This is not something that I customarily do in terms of trying to help a developer figure out a solution that is mandatory to me. But it's that important to make sure that the daycare remains. There are additional questions about jobs and local hiring that I'm gonna turn it back to my uh, colleague, Councilmember Levin. Let, let, me, let me just say, we have contacted every real estate broker in downtown Brooklyn to try and find a space. I know that your staff has been looking at, and, and we've spoken to uh, public housing authority projects, uh, one of them, it seems, has a space, but it's too small. I mean, we, we, we certainly are looking to do that. The second thing uh, about what a reasonable rent would be that is reasonable to us and reasonable to the uh, Brooklyn uh, Community Services is something that our client will take up with Brooklyn Community Services to come up with what that number is rather than here without them, without a, a negotiation with them uh, to see what that what that number might be for uh, a, a space built exclusively for them for their purposes that would be um, usable and um, probably more economical to operate than their current facility. Um, and we will have that discussion um, and we'll get back to you as to whether we've come to an agreement or what the, where we are in terms of that. In terms of other spaces, we have tried. Uh, downtown Brooklyn is, uh, is a pretty hot market at the moment, um, and uh, 15,000 feet, uh, I mean 12,000 feet is, uh, is a significant uh, number. Um, there have been a number of buildings, uh, residential buildings, built in downtown Brooklyn in, in the last five, five or six years. Uh, and, um, you know, looking at this one as being the one uh, to accommodate the daycare center, there were, have been other opportunities we understand that it's, it's on our site, um, and we will try and, uh, and accommodate it, but um, um, we have to have that discussion with, with Brooklyn Community Services. All right, I look forward to it. Um, again, I think I've stated how important this is to me, and I will also turn it over now to Chair Levin. Thank you, Majority Leader. Um, <clears throat> oh, sorry, we need to swear you in, I'm sorry. Please raise your right hand and state your name for the record. I'm Jim Benyasso. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony and answers you have provided today have been the truth, uh, have been and will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and you'll answer all questions truthfully? Thank you. Um, okay, I want to follow up on another um, zoning question here. On, um, C64 is a very flexible zoning district that could allow for a 14-story, 10 FAR office building that you have proposed, but could also allow for a 30-story, 
10 FAR hotel or a 34 story 12 FAR residential building. Um, why, why should we be confident that the zoning would lead to a proposed office building rather than a much taller um, alternative that's uh, residential or, well, or hotel? Well, there, there are a couple things. Um, first of all, it would have been a lot easier for us if we wanted to do a residential building to ask for a residential zoning district. Um, it would have saved us a lot of time and effort in the environmental. We wouldn't have had to look at two things rather than one. Um, so that's, first of all, um, there was no reason to uh, ask for a commercial zone if we were going to want to do a residential building. And secondly, the lesser group, if you look at, at their portfolio of properties, they're not a residential developer. Um, they've been in this business for a long time. That is not something that they, that they do. Uh, they, the uh, residential would come with affordable housing components. It's not anything that they've, that they've ever done. So I think those are the reasons why uh, with confidence, you could say that this will be a, uh, what they say it's going to be, which is a commercial office building. Um, those are the reasons. <clears throat> that said, there's nothing that would prevent uh, the lesser group from selling the property to a residential developer under uh, circumstances like that. Absolutely not. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, Presumably, um, the concerns that were raised by city planning would be, um, you know, further, um, those impacts would be uh, uh, increased if, if it was a 34-story, 12 FAR residential tower rather than a 14-story, 10 FAR office building, right? Well, from a from an environmental impact point of view, uh, there's a negative declaration. So, um, so the 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 comments that city planning made were counter to some extent to the negative declaration that the city planning commission adopted, um, which said there were no light and air impacts and other things like that. Um, Certainly, their concern, um, which wasn't fully fleshed out, is um, I don't know whether the, residen whether the residential development would have more or fewer cars on the street and things like that, because um, um, in either case, uh, the environmental impact statement the environmental assessment led to a negative declaration. So, mm -hmm. um, so I'm assuming that since they signed those declarations, they stand behind them, and they said that there were not, no environmental uh, impacts. Um, what kind of office tenants would you envision in this space? Would that um, include not-for-profit organizations? Um, here is here are the types of users that are in uh, the lesser group buildings. This is certainly not by far the full list, but you can see on there, um, there is, there is uh, some not-for-profit uh, medical facilities. Um, um, the FBI, I think, is not-for-profit. Um, um, and, and, and there are many others. Brooklyn Community, Serv mm -hmm. Brooklyn Community Services, which is at this location, is at another location that the lesser group has, and they're a tenant, so. Okay. Um, and then do you have a plan in place to ensure local hiring or MWBE participation during construction? How many local hires would typically be involved in a project like this, and how would we be in, able to ensure follow-up and progress reports on I, these commitments? I think someone on the next panel will talk to that. Um, and then what about resiliency measures that are uh, incorporated into the design and construction? Say it again. Resiliency measures, sustainability and resiliency measures? Yes. All right, which, which ones? <laughs> all, all, all the ones. All. Um, all. Um, no, I mean, the borough president raised that, raised that at the hearing. Um, the architect indicated that, that we would be looking at, at the um, um, uh, green roof um, and um, um, to uh, uh, retain uh, stormwater um, um, in terms of the full design and, and the uh, energy savings through the d 
design of the envelope of the building. Um, that'll, that'll come with the, uh, uh, with the design. I, it's obviously, we'll comply with all of the city rules and regulations, which, as you know, have uh, increased recently, and there are a lot more uh, environmental regulations for development that, uh, that the city's implemented. Okay. <clears throat> I'll turn it back over to Majority Leader. Sorry. I have no other questions, and so I, I thank you for this portion, and I'm sure we're going to call up the next panel. Yes. Also, just one thing I just did want to add uh, in support of what our majority leader said about the importance of that uh, day daycare program. I visited that daycare program very early on um, in my tenure, um, even though it wasn't my district, but um, know how important it is to the surrounding community and uh, has played an important role. Uh, and, and so I support you know, the effort that she's making. To I, we, we totally agree that daycare center is important and there should be more than one. There should be a number of them. Um, some of it has to do with city, with city uh, you know, contracting, city requirements, um, you know, what the city contract is willing to allocate to rental. Um, there are a number of things that certainly um, impact on, um, on daycare centers and, um, and you know, in this neighborhood, uh, there certainly should be more. Okay. We, we don't disagree on that. Gotcha. I'm, l I'm looking at your portfolio and it seems to be about almost 20 institutions here, business, commercial, health, institutional. So as you have such a wide portfolio, some projects are gonna be more uh, financially rewarding than other projects will be. So because you have the breadth of a large portfolio Certain projects, some are gonna be a cash cow, some are gonna be a little philanthropic. It'll be important for you to see this one more on the philanthropic side versus this being a cash cow in your portfolio. It's gonna be important for us to see this, to serve the community, the need of the community. And the proof is in the pudding. I don't know if there would be another landlord who in the last four years would give away something so cheap and almost for free to serve the community. And I am in full support of that. I, I think that it's admirable that you kept the rent at the price that you did for so long. And I think that while this particular daycare has serviced the community for over 20 years, um, when you purchased this property and the daycare was there, the real estate market for that particular area wasn't so hot and happening as it is now still a viable place, but they were there at a time in the community where Brooklyn wasn't the hip hop and happening place and the hottest place on the planet. And now that an organization that has grown with the community, provided services for the community, now that the borough is experiencing growth and, and development and all of this, it's my role as a city council member to make sure that those original people that were there helping to make the community what it is today are able to thrive and to, and to be a part of the growth and the excitement of Brooklyn, New York. So that's really what it is to me. It's not, you know, it, it's great that people have been able to be there for as long as they were to take Brooklyn where it is, but we need to make sure that we support them in where they're going. And I wanna support projects that are going to reward people for being there during the difficult times and contributing to the growth of a borough as a whole. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next panel. Ed Brown, Team Brown, and Jessica Ortiz from 32BJ. Whoever wants to begin. Good afternoon. Um, I'm speaking for one of our members. Unfortunately, he had to go to work, so he wasn't able to stay. 
Uh, good afternoon, Council Member Levin and Majority Leader Cumbo. My name is Federico Hernandez, and I have been a member of 32BJ for six years. I'm here today on behalf of my union to express our support for the proposed development at a 101 Fleet Place. As you know, 32BJ is the largest property service union in the country. We represent over 80,000 members across New York City, including over 3,600 who live and work in Community District 2. Members like me clean, maintain, and secure office residential and school buildings like the one being discussed today. We are happy to report that the applicant for this project, the Lesser Group, has made a credible commitment to pay prevailing wages to the future property service workers at this site. A prevailing wage job like mine allows working families in the city to live with dignity. Before I got that job and getting paid the prevailing wage, I struggled to support my family. Raising two kids without health insurance and job security was very stressful. Now I have peace of mind and never worry if I am going to be able to pay my rent. All working families deserve this. Due to the proposed density, we estimate that the project will generate nine building service jobs. We know these jobs will provide an important economic opportunity for members of the surrounding community. We urge you to approve this project. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me see. Can you hear me? How you guys doing? Um, chivalry is not dead. I had to let the lady go first, okay? So, um, uh, how you guys doing? Ed Brown, Team Brown Consulting. I'm sorry. And lady. <laughs> and lady. I apologize, council member. Um, Ed Brown, Team Brown Consulting. If this project is approved, I uh, will be, be working directly with them and the Ingersoll Tennis Association, as well as Whitman and Farragut, to assure that uh, residents, local people, will work on this project. And unlike other projects, because this is not a NYCHA project where there's a lease requirement, the opportunities here are more broad and, and more easily, uh, are more easily able to funnel residents into the project. And I just want to add something about the daycare center. It's important to me as well. My three older children went to that daycare center. So it means something to me as well. So I have follow-up questions. Um, mm -hmm. That was actually going to be one of my questions because um, you have lived in Ingersoll for a number of years, mm -hmm. and so you understand uh, the importance of this particular daycare. Yeah. Also wanted to say that while it's important to extend to Whitman, Ingersoll, and Farragut, I always have to encourage you to expand that outreach to both Atlantic Terminal as well as um, Lafayette Garden because mm -hmm. they are part of the 35th district. And for me, I represent my entire district. So okay. want that there sure. to be a pipeline of outreach there as well. How many jobs do you anticipate the construction for the proposed 14-story building would generate? Well, that's always hard to anticipate until I see the full scope of the project in reference to, um, you know, when it's approved, what's actually approved, and what it's going to entail, and then also depending on the skill sets that are need, needed. So I wouldn't be able to give you a num number like that until if the project is approved, and I sat down with the owner, and we went and over the different trades that were available at the project, then I would be able to give you a, you know, a ballpark figure of the amount of uh, slots we can fill. So let me ask you this question. A project vastly larger than the project that we're talking about would be uh, BAM South, mm -hmm. and you worked on that project. Yep. How many jobs were generated out of that particular project through your local hiring right. efforts? So at its peak, the exact number, and I like to you know, tout this because this is one of our greatest accomplishments, was 37 jobs. Okay. And they're not 37 working at the same time because different trades move at, diff move at um, different times, but throughout the entire project, 37. And one of our um, great accomplishments is we have a young man who has never done construction who was recently in, uh, returned from incarceration. He started out as a laborer on BAM South. And right now, even though the project is over for us, he's now a superintendent on the job and has a permanent job with Two Trees now. He's making like $70,000 a year. So, so this is our goal. This is what we try to do. E each project is not going to be the same. But if we have those ambitious young men who, who understand work ethic, basic work, work ethic, we work with them. And we work with the developer to try to get them not only to work on one project, 
but stay on for other projects and then move to different, different projects throughout the city. Can you cite for me another example of a project that you've worked on within the 35th Council District and what was the employment opportunity? With, within the 35th, um, uh, of course, the Ingersoll project, but that was a little difficult because of the lease requirement. You had, you know, the workers had to be on the NYCHA lease in, in order to get the jobs. Um, so with that type of restriction in place, how many jobs were you able to fill on the Ingersoll project? Well, directly, probably maybe about seven at the most because, as I said, you know, it's not just a lease requirement. NYCHA actually does a background check to make sure that the person who's actually applying for the job is really a lease holding resident. And so, you know, you have a lot of people who say that they're on the lease, but once they do the background check and they check, you find out that they're not on the lease. And we, we really don't have any control over that. But um, Fulton Street, 1081 Fulton Street, I believe it was, and then the one on Atlantic Avenue that was connected to Cadman, the Cadman Library Project with um, Ryan Hudson Companies. Um, we had um, 16 on Atlantic Avenue. I don't have the exact numbers, but I can get them for you. All you have to do is request them, I'll send them to you. Okay. Um, and uh, Fulton was a smaller project, so I think we had maybe about maybe about eight people, maybe nine people at the most on that particular project. It all depends on the size of the project. But on, another one of our big accomplishments on a larger project was 345 Lafayette with Slate. We had about 11 people on that project. And um, to date, mainly, mainly most of our workers were placed on two trees projects, um, Dock Street. We did a lot of workers on Dock Street as well. So. Let me just ask, so a project like the Slate Project, where you said you were able to have about 11 workers, mm -hmm. 11 workers out of what would you estimate would be a total workforce? On that particular project, coming and going, probably maybe about, maybe about 40, maybe 40 to 50. But then, but then, as I said, because we don't provide training as of yet, something we, we're thinking about doing, a lot of the young men that we work with in the community, sometimes this is their first job. They, you know, they have never worked before, and they really have limited skills. So we'll have, you know, people come in as laborers, and if they would pay attention and do what they're supposed to do, you know, they can move and learn another trade. We have one particular young man who came in as a laborer, and he became a mason, a mason and now he's a master carpenter. So it all, all depends on the individual, and as I said, there has to be something we could probably discuss down the road. There has to be some type of training programs in place, not just OSHA, mm -hmm. so that we can get these guys really prepared before these projects actually come and take place. So let me ask you this question. I'm going a little bit off topic, but okay. the individuals that you, it's 37 on this one, it's 11 on this one, it's mm -hmm. seven on that mm -hmm. one. What happens to the individuals after the project is over and there's not another project just waiting for them that you've got lined up? Where do those workers go? Well, what I do is if I don't have anything lined up, I'll call some people I know and ask them, can they do me a favor? Do they have anything open right now until I get something? And then I'll you know, refer people to them that way. But mainly what happens is my telephone blows up on a regular basis. They, if they work more than six months, they collect unemployment. If they didn't, then my phone is blowing up because they're begging to go back to work. But I'm limited because we really don't have, you know, we at, at the most we'll maybe have two or th three projects going at the same time. We're not at the point yet where we have enough projects to f uh, fulfill the need right now. So my, my final question to you is, and just as succinctly as you can answer this question, because mm -hmm. it's a huge question, mm -hmm. but as succinctly as possible, mm -hmm. with everything that you just described, as far as local hiring, mm -hmm. and you have made a footprint for your company in the downtown mm -hmm. area, mm -hmm. what would you need in place to be the local hiring company of the year that's got this thing down to a science, <laughs> like that's that got question. local hiring on lockdown? I like, like that you, question. You've, you've mastered what it takes to be a local hiring feeder in our communities. What essentially would be needed to do that? Well, what I would do, what I would need is to sit down with the legislators, mm -hmm. present a proposal to show soup to nuts, everything from the soft skills to, as I said, 
uh, um, entry level training, not advanced training, you know, basic carpentry, bring in instructors, have a location or different locations. And mainly the issue is that when developers come in, there are so many, how could you say, um, you heard the word coalitions. So many coalitions that are just grabbing for different sites, there has to be a central situation where when developers come into your district or any district, you sit with this person and this is gonna be the person that you go to in reference to providing the workers. Um, I, w I even wanna get to the point where I could um, provide the uh, correct um, MWBE uh, contractors as well, because that's also another issue with getting, getting more MWBEs involved on, on these jobs. So basically it's about the legislators and when people come into your districts to say, listen, this is what we want, this is who you need to sit down with, and let's come up with a plan and let's make it happen. And then hold me accountable to make sure I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing and I follow up with you guys so that you guys can see it's effective. Okay, we'll talk more about it offline. I, ha okay. I, I have well, I a lot of that. questions about that. Appreciate because that. I want to think about this issue as our terms are concluding, of course, not only how it impacts, of course, my district, but how we're able to create the appropriate systems mm -hmm. and I guess you could say assembly line, if you will, not the right term, but how do all districts have in place a mechanism or an equation or a rubric for how local hiring is done right. the same in every district, but with variations based off of the needs of that district. So that's, that's something we have to really get right because a lot of people say, I'm gonna do local hiring, I'm gonna do local hiring, and then at the right. end of the project, everyone in the community right. is saying there were no jobs provided right. for us. Exactly. So we wanna obviously change that dynamic. Well, I look forward to sitting down with you, but the last thing I wanna say is, traditionally, it's just been a free fall, mm -hmm. you know, People have come in and developed, and whoever showed up, they just went along with it. Mm -hmm. So, um, yes, there needs to, to be a reinvention of the wheel, that when you come into a district, this, this is what has to be done. Okay, thank All you. Right. Thank you. Any more questions? Sorry, there's one more. Oh, no, thanks. Oh, okay. Thank you. thank you very much. How's your son, council member? Doing well, doing well, yes. Mm -hmm. Almost crawling. Mm -hmm. Very, very almost crawling. Um, which I'm not ready for yet. Uh, next, uh, Bryce Jacobs, Coalition of Ro uh, Rockaway, is that right? Good, after good afternoon, everybody, thank you. My name is Bruce Jacobs, Coalition of the Rockaways, supporter of medical and religious freedom, 9-11 first responder, U.S. Navy veteran, 30 years with New York City Transit. I commend the county, the city planning commission for what they, when they said bring down the size. The size, 14 stories, they wanted 21 originally. It's too, on that small street, too big of a building. I also agree that I don't want to see people from the neighborhood thrown out, like this daycare at, from $15 to $42 an hour. That's the displacement that the Coalition of the Rockaways and other districts is against. The thing of jobs, I tell you the truth, my organization cares more about union jobs for people for futures. In the Rockaway, we don't want a job that the guy works one year and then he don't have no work after that. To my organization and to me personally, it's a very important thing. Because to go get a regular job, and I had, say I had problems, just say, and then I worked for one year, that's not gonna really help me that much. It's gonna help me for that, that second. Then I might go back to doing bad things because I might not wanna do it, you know, little things. There's also a big amount of traffic there already I, we did develop the neighborhood, the neighborhood's developed, but I don't want to see everybody thrown out of this neighborhood because of high-priced developers. Anybody could come in front of a commission with a big lawyer, and you know, they get approved for everything. Say I want to knock down my house in my neighborhood. Do I have to go get a fancy lawyer to do it, or is it gonna be a thing of caring about your neighborhood? I care about Queens, Brooklyn, New York City completely. And like I said, I commend the City Planning Commission 
for keeping into consideration other stores, other people. The guy's talking, there's no guarantees that he's gonna keep it as a, just an office building. Then they can sell it to somebody else. There's no guarantee in writing. And if they do, and then they put up the 34 story hotel, then it's all like the goodness, because you guys have good hearts and mean well. It's gonna fall apart because it's already that you go down there, you, a regular person could hardly get an apartment down there. You know, regular Ernie, you know, the, the prices are so high, it's ridiculous. I like development, but the right development. Like you said about other districts implicating for jobs, we need, in all districts, it's very important factor. Because without that, if you're gonna say, in my neighborhood, yeah, and then the daughter not using union apprenticeship programs, to me, you need that because that's a future for the people. If you accept it on one job, not, you know, like that, then what about the other jobs that you guys approve for other districts? Like in Far Rockaway, we're going through a big thing over there because we want to see the guys get futures and get a career and get training. You know, I personally work with, the, with, with these, you know, unions and trying to, you know, work out something. You know, when you get a commitment, you have to make sure that it's really there because anybody could sell something. It sounds good. The man who was speaking about jobs, yeah, that's nice. He's, you know, spoke very nice and, you know, good ideas, but he's not the developer. And then you're talking 11 jobs, you're talking 12 jobs. For 14 stories, there gotta be more jobs than that. Mm -hmm. And 14 stories for Fleet Street is too big. Nine stories, the daycare must be able to come back mm -hmm. at 15, at whatever they're paying now. They were in the neighborhood before. This is displacement. Somebody bought property with a daycare in it. Mm -hmm. They knew that they're there. That's like me buying a house with rent control. Yeah, I want, that. I want to charge them more when it gets worth more money, but what about when it was worth nothing? Because I worked on Nevin Street in your community in the transit. I know what it used to be. You could hardly walk outside. But the thing is, is that I don't want to see the people displaced from like the, you know, the city house and, and Atlantic and all the other places. They also deserve help. The whole neighborhood, there's private homes on these blocks. I appreciate the, the things, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Um, are there any other members of the public who wish to testify? Seeing none, uh, I now close the public hearing on this application, and that concludes today's meeting. I'd like to thank all the members of the public and my colleagues and council and Andy staff for attending, and this meeting is hereby adjourned. Thank you. Have a nice day.